Today is July 24th, 2012. 2012. And who are you? I'm Elaine Arsenal. I'm Donald Petney Perry's partner. And, and we're sitting here in beautiful Sam's in downtown Northampton, waiting for a jury to make a decision that is going to have such an impact on your life. Right. right. And uh, so there, there are lots of folks who are watching this program um, who don't know who you are or why this is important so can you tell us a little something about this this trial is about um, my boyfriend and he was picked up a year ago August 3rd um, and he was accused of stealing something and having stolen goods in his car and one of the um, issues that's been behind the story is that um, first they thought he had burglarized some homes, and when they questioned me, I let them know that he was with me all night because we live and sleep in the same house. And in, from the beginning, they didn't listen to what he was saying. When he was 19 years old, he got in trouble. Right. He spent some time in jail. Right. And since then, how long has he been out of jail? Well, he spent um, 18 years in prison, and he has been out for 11 years, and he got out on parole, and since he's been out, um, he put himself through college, he became educated, um, he did a lot of different jobs to be able to support himself, and then eventually, you know, support his family, and um, some of his jobs have included um, helping other people that have come out of prisons and jails. Um, he worked as a house manager at a homeless shelter for a while. Then he went on to um, work at ServiceNet as a housing manager um, and started housing homeless people and eventually worked his way up where he was actually running his own program in Northampton. And he worked with homeless men and women and also ran a food pantry and then started a food pantry um, in Amherst and worked at the food kitchen there. So he's, his life has completely been dedicated to giving back to the community and reaching out to those that might need a, hand, a helping hand. So this is a year, almost a year to the day that he was arrested. Right. And he's finally come to court, finally come to trial. And has he been free during this year? No, after they picked him up, they, um, they kept him on a warrant because once you're on parole, it's up to the parole board whether you can be free or not. So parole basically kept him on a warrant for the whole year. Um, he has been housed at Franklin County Jail. Um, it hasn't been a very pleasant experience for either one of us. We have a home and we have a family and it's been incredibly difficult for us. Um, first of all, being separate because we, you know, we spend all our time together. And for us to be separated like this has been really difficult. We're down to one income and with that one income we've had to really, you know, work on this paying lawyers and defense and, you know, having a lot of other expenses incurred by, you know, jail and things like that. So, um, you know, we've managed to kind of scrape by and make it through, but it's been really a tough year on both of us. You were actually on the jury, on the, on the witness stand. I was on the witness stand. How, what was that like for you, testifying on behalf of Donald, your, your partner? Right. Well, it was really scary. Um, even though we prepared for days, you know, you just never know what it's going to be like when you get up there. You want to say the right thing. You want to be truthful. Um, I wasn't sure uh, what kind of questions they were going to ask, even though we practiced a little bit. Um, but it, I think it went well once I got up there, because what I wanted people to know was what kind of man he is, 
And, you know, he's a very warm, funny, generous man. You know, he's very compassionate. And I wanted that to come out, you know, that people get to know him for who he is because this has been his life. And his life passion is to help other people. And I really want to see people to understand that. Yeah. Now, one of the things that, that hasn't come out in our discussion, and uh, but I think is important, is that he's an African American man. Yes. Yes. And I think that's one of the reasons why they were so easily picked him up. You know, one of the things that they were saying um, was, oh, you know, are you from Springfield? And, you know, we're we live in Montague, and even though, you know, I'm white and he's black, there's not a lot of African-American men living in my area, and you do get profiled a lot, and it's been an issue for the three or four years we've been together, you know, we've had people say racist things to us, um, we've had people invite or not invite us to parties, and, you know, you think that that's all gone, but even realize going into the relationship about how much of an impact it would have on our lives. And Donald used to say to me, you know, people are going to say things. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. You know, people don't do that anymore. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of really horrible things shouted at us. People say things to us. And it's really blown my mind. Yeah. You know, and to go this where I think if he had been a white man driving out of my driveway and they saw he lived in Montague, I think that things would have gone very differently than the way it's gone now. You know, I just had a conversation with somebody. We we're talking about Barack Obama being elected president, yeah. and, and you know, and she's marveling at how here he is. You know, this black man is president. And it was actually on the Mall in Washington when he was when he was inaugurated, and there were I, I mean, I was in this sea of African American people my age and just a little younger who and we were all in tears yeah. because it was such an event. You know, they'd say, you know, if my father could have seen this. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it was unbelievable. And so it is an event. But at the same time, the reality right. in this country is so right. much of what you're talking about. Right. Right. Yeah, that, that really is the reality. And I've worked, um, personally, I've worked in Holyoke and Springfield school districts. And one of the biggest things is, is just like the impoverishment of people of color and how, you know, they're just not given the opportunities. And Donald has actually surpassed so many barriers to become a, a, a man uh, that's respected in the community, you know, a man that's educated. He has had to work 200% of the time to bring himself to this level, to be like a middle class black man. Whereas a lot of people have that privilege just given to them. So could you tell me your name? Because you're here at Sam's, part of the crew that's supporting Don Perry. And uh, and so what what brings you here? How come you're you're part of this wonderful well, I, I group? I work a lot, you know, in all kinds of areas and human services and so on. So I believe in injustice and unfortunately uh, I don't see that there's much justice in this particular case. Just in terms of um, the evidence that I've seen presented in the court. I didn't know much about what was going on before. I, I went to court with no pre preconceived notions about what was going on and so on and so forth. But the more I heard, the more I led me to question, you know, whether uh, justice is served in this case. When I found out that basically, you know, there was no prints, you know, and, and the whole story was like contrived, about, particularly by the police department, unfortunately. Um, it concerned me. Uh, in, initially, the grand jury testimony in, indicated there was DNA and fingerprints and so on and so forth. And then to find out that the prints were never sent to the crime lab was very disturbing to me, and that kept me coming back. So I'm involved basically because not only is Don Perry's um, uh, partner, a 
friend of mine, has been a friend of mine for nine years. I've worked with, know her very well, worked for Mass Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children with her uh, for years, you know. So I don't I doubt her veracity, and I know that if someone can't be in, the, in one particular shoes when things are going on, you can't account for it. Uh, every individual and know what they're doing at all times, but I, I'm particularly disturbed, like I said, before the evidence coming out. There's a footprint that's found that belongs to this mystery man, you know, he wasn't involved in an actual robbery, the police concluded that, uh, but yet and still, because he's found with items in his car, it's, it's, it's supposed to be a conjecture that he's, he's guilty. He testified that, you know, somebody was there in the car with him, uh, and the items belong to the person, I didn't see too much police work around trying to, to find that individual because they certainly had an opportunity to get a description so on and so forth. Um, there's a lot of times things were, were missing in terms of evidence in the case being released to other people, not identified, so on and so forth. That, that's particularly disturbing. Um, a lot of police involvement. If the state police initially decided to follow this car, there were too many people at the scene, or the Amherst police, the Northampton police, the state police, to the point where there were 20 cars involved tampering with the evidence, okay? And supposedly, you know, you're supposed to be guilty beyond reasonable doubt. And unfortunately... Well, that's how you have to be found guilt, guilty without beyond a reasonable doubt, right? Yes, yes, yes. And with no evidence, you know, and just conjecture, it's particularly disturbing to me. And so... Um, that's that's why I was involved, and the more I heard, the more I felt like I had was compelled to come back. You know, Elaine's a friend of mine. I've met Don a few times. My husband knows Don, and my, uh, and the little bit of time that I spent with Don, I thought, okay, so he's a good person. Don't know him terribly well. It was more of an acquaintance. But my husband spent more time with him. I realized that he's a, a, a person with a lot of moral convictions. He was telling me just the other day, you know, every time he sees him, he, he's reading the Bible. He has a belief in faith in humanity. And, and from everybody I've spoken to, even people who, who don't know him well, he was there to lend a helping hand and to be a friend and not look down on anybody and treat people in a respectful way, in a, in a courteous way. And to see, in a sense, that he's not afforded those opportunities in jail at this particular time, because, like I said, a lot of uh, evidence was uh, suppressed, especially in the, in the first trial. I think that his attorney did a fabulous job because they uncovered a lot of evidence. I mean, for the grand jury to be told by a police officer those, the, the evidence existed for bring offense and then find out it never happened, and all the other things that are attributed to this trial that are really sketchy, um, that, that's why I'm involved at this point. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm wondering, how, how do you think you only heard about this because Elaine is a friend of yours? Um, yes. You know, there's, there's not a lot, there hasn't been a lot of publicity about this trial. I know there hasn't been. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I, I don't understand why um, there's no follow-up because certainly when um, this situation first occurred, there was a lot of follow-up and there was a lot of finger-pointing and, and a lot of things that were going on that were not conclusive and not, not based on the facts. So it, it would be my hope that if the situation came up, that people would follow the story, okay? Yes. Not follow all, all the, you know, the, the rumors and the nuennials out there, but follow the story throughout. Because there could be possibly with somebody being really innocent here, yes. but the presumption of guilt has been laid out there. So I think that the public needs to know that if someone, okay, if there's, there's problems in the, in the in testimony of some of the police officers and some of the witnesses and the lack of evidence, I think that the public should be allowed to conclude their, you know, their own uh, uh, opinion about what's going on because obviously that has not been brought up. The Gazette and all those other people who, who were there following it initially have not been there to follow now. So no matter what, even if, if the, he is acquitted, people will you know, remain with that in their consciousness that he's guilty because nobody ever took the time to, to follow it through to see that he may have been presumed innocent and distributed those facts to, you know, to people who should know, you know, so that he might have another chance to, to, to be accepted within the community, so on and so forth, instead of always being, you know, um, the 
not, not, not so much fictional leper, but I think it's a leper, a societal leper, you know, uh -huh. because of all the, the misinformation that was put out yes. initially. Yeah. So let me ask you, you were in the court today. Is this the first day you were in court, or have you been here? I've been in court Friday. I, uh -huh. I work, so it was hard for me to get yes. here. Yes. Um, and I work, you know, in a sense, I work a lot with the courts and hospitals and so on and so forth. So I've had cases of my own through work that kind of kept me away. But, uh, yeah, I just made an attempt. I was here Friday, and I'm also here today. And I'm definitely my support to him. A lot of people that I spoke to had to end, not even known Don. They were just there as court watcher. They wanted to see what was going on. You know, and I think they were really surprised by the fact that all these things, it was a really bungled um, uh, investigation. Even one of the police officers, you know, inferred that it was bungled, yes. that evidence was touched, you know, and, and there were so many people involved, things strewn all about the place, so on and so forth. And, and either because the evidence was so tampered with, they never got an opportunity to bring it to the crime lab, you know? So how do you conclude on conjecture that someone's guilty, you know? Do you have any new beliefs or...? No, I mean, I, I realized, okay, they were good and bad. Sometimes justice really is served, so on and so forth. But in this case, I don't believe it was. You know, like I said, there's too much conjecture. Even closing ar arguments by the prosecutor was kind of disturbing also to me because, you know, it was more, you know, in a sense, he was instructing the jury, you know, we don't really know. Nobody really knows what went on. Uh, this evidence was found with him. It's so reasonable to conclude if the thing was placed near him, it must be his. Which is totally preposterous, okay? I mean, seriously, if I'm sitting in your pocketbook, you know, and, and it's presumed that it's mine, and I walk away with it, there's going to be some charges applied to me, I'm sure, okay? It, you know, so what you see is not necessarily what is fact, okay? So those are the things that's come about in this trial, but not only that, I've met a lot of people who have similar circumstances. Uh, there were some court watches in it, they didn't have any idea, just like myself, actually what had occurred. I know he was arrested, he was picked up, he was a but to hear those facts and to hear them have the facts come out and have other stories generated from their own personal experience of other wrongdoings that have been done, you know, it, it, it spread my interest. It, I think that in a sense there was a group of people that I never knew uh -huh. that we all were brought together just based on the fact that we couldn't believe what was being heard and, and the fact that we got a chance to talk about race, justice, you know, and truth and morality and that's the, that's the one part that came out of this. So it's my hope, just based on the testimony, I don't believe that the man was guilty, okay, and that, that he gets exonerated. We do hope that. What brought you to this trial, Ann? Well, I, um, I met Don maybe 16 years ago when I was teaching in, in, at Shirley, and he was an inmate in medium security. He struck me and my colleague, um, I was working with another woman, um, as being one of the most impressive students we'd ever run into in terms of his um, genuine attempt, genuine honest attempt to look at himself and to rehabilitate himself. So since that time, I've had my fingers crossed with Donald Perry, and I, I knew that he was out of prison um, because I'd heard his name mentioned, but I couldn't find him. I didn't know anyone who knew him, and I couldn't find him. I looked on the internet, and I'm not particularly internet savvy, but I wanted to just touch down. Um, my husband and I were at Quaker meeting one time, and who should come out of the children's room at the end of the meeting but Donald? I was so thrilled. It was it. It's such a personal. You, you, you become so invested in your in your students and in people's lives. And and uh, I'm a gardener. I, I I love to see things around me flourish. Uh -huh. So I was thrilled. To, to, to find Donald at Quaker meeting. And um, and then I didn't see him again, I didn't know where he was, just it was a hearsay sort of thing. And again, a hearsay sort of thing, I heard that he had picked up a hitchhiker who had, had stolen goods and, and uh, the hitchhiker had ditched him and there he was with the stolen goods, so he was in possession and he was um, caught. So uh, again, I, I couldn't locate him, I didn't know where he was. 
um, and it happened to be in someone's home when, when she picked up a phone and was I overheard her saying, well, uh, Luke is going to be is busy because he's going to be using, he's going to be working on Donald Perry's trial. So it was just so synchronous. Isn't it amazing? It yes. was amazing. And it was, a day, it was the day before the trial was to begin. So naturally, I came down. I had to find out. And I didn't know whether he was guilty or, or not. And I just wanted to support him, whether he had had a relapse or not. Um, but I am thrilled to find out now about his life, to find out about his life through the people that have been living that life with him, which I haven't. I've been out of touch. Um, and I am so happy for him that he has that he's doing such good work, that he is so deeply respected. Um, I just, I just, you know, blessings, blessings on, blessings so, on. Uh, so 15 years ago, you were a teacher, you were, do, you were, at, you, uh, yes. At, we, at Shirley, at, at a yes. prison, a state prison yes. in, uh, yes. in Shirley, Shirley Mass. Mass. A uh -huh. federal prison. Uh -huh. A federal prison. I think it was a federal prison. Yeah. yeah. So, so he had served a number of years in jail, and and then really did what you know what we all hope would happen in, when people are incarcerated that they would have a rehabilitation and change their lives. And it sounds like because of a lot of people like you who really did invest in him. Um, that he really did change his life. He had an experience in solitary confinement where he was sitting there looking at the walls and in his words, the walls became mirrors. And there was no one left for him to blame. He was looking squarely at himself. Something that so few of us so few of us really do. I was so impressed. And he decided from that confrontation on, he didn't like what he saw. He didn't like what he saw. He could only see himself and he didn't like what he saw. And that he was going to take advantage of everything that the prison had to offer in terms of rehabilitation from then on out. And it was a real turning point in his life. So the jury just gave the verdict. What was the verdict? The verdict, the verdict was not guilty, just unanimous. as it should be. Yep. Ah, unanimous. Yep. Yes. Yes. So, what unanimous. are some thoughts, comments, feelings? A uh, piece of justice has been meted out, and Donald will prevail. Yes. You're here. Yeah. Want to say something here? I'm just <laughs> thankful and blessed to be in. That you guys are just so the family for yeah. being there for. Yeah. For the community, this is for, for for the people, you know? Like, this is justice for the people. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Thank goodness. I would just say, you know, there's so much, so many battles we're fighting and so many bad pieces of news, and it's things, it's moments like this that keep us all going. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what's the story now? So what happens now? So now he goes before the parole board, and since there are no new charges, he will be released. And so we're planning on him coming home very soon. So is that, is the parole board today, tomorrow? Um, you're you have to petition, so he'll be taken to another location, which we won't know right now. Um, it depends on where the beds are, and then they will. He has to write a letter petitioning the board to ask for release, and so that's the next step right there. So you'll keep all your supporters apprised of that. Absolutely, and uh, Absolutely. and you know that there are hundreds of people who have been cheering you on, who have I been cheering for yeah. Don and you and. Yeah. For justice, is yep. what you said it. Yeah. Okay, so there he is. The, the minister has something. What did you have to say? Uh, <laughs> you say amen. I say amen. amen. amen.